Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. And I'm Matamor Cronin. And this week we're talking about the future of education. So Matamor, can you tell us why this is such an important topic? Yeah, so every topic we've talked about thus far on the podcast, it all rests on the assumption that there are going to be smart, creative people in future generations that can figure this out. But that's not a given. That's only going to happen if we give them the tools needed to tackle things like autonomous weapons, things like global climate change, Mm -hmm. things like the most critical one, I believe, is AI and the path to super intelligence. If we aren't able, and when I say we, I mean humanity, but if you look at it even on a smaller level, if the United States isn't able to get its shit together and invest in education and invest in the future of our kids, then we're going to continue to fall behind in the rankings. And we could see a world where, you know, China or other less free societies win out in the race towards AI super intelligence. And that could mean some very, uh, uh, like a very terrible dystopia for all of humanity. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's very, it's almost the most critical topic of anything because everything else rests on the assumption that we will have good education for the future. Yeah, it's just the foundation of everything that we have talked about and will talk about. Right. So before we get into the different future scenarios, I think it would be good to talk about the current state of the education system. So what are your thoughts on the current state of education in America specifically? And we can talk about the world later on. Yeah, so in America specifically, I, I'm i kind of pessimistic about the public education system because it was a system that was created in the Industrial Revolution era. It was designed to churn out people that were very good at following orders and think very rigidly and do what they're told. And that's about it. We, we've we kind of gotten to the point where schools just crush all the creativity in children. And think about how smart kids actually are. Like, for example, when I was six or seven years old, I was already using the scientific method. Well, I did it once. <laughs> and so, so when I um, lost probably my fifth or sixth tooth I you know I knew about the tooth fairy at that point and then I started thinking about it I was like hmm this kind of sounds like bullshit so (laughs) I I had a hypothesis which was the tooth fairy is bullshit and I lost my tooth didn't tell my parents so I designed this experiment (laughs) and you know a week later, the tooth fairy still hasn't come and decided, oh, the tooth fairy isn't real. And that's how I found out. So it's, I think kids, that's not unique to me. I think kids in general are really creative and really curious. We just have to let them be creative and curious and not stifle that. Totally. And I think our, our current education system just crushes it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of an Alex of an Alan Watts quote. He one of my favorite philosophers, but he said that a tree is no better than an acorn. So in other words, a tree may just be an acorn's way of creating more acorns. So <laughs> it's not like an educated working member of society is fundamentally better than a child who's not educated yet. And it actually in many ways it's the opposite because oftentimes with enlightenment you're trying to get back to the roots of the way you experienced the world as a kid. But throughout the whole education system, it's sort of like that's beaten out of you. And like you said, with the Industrial Revolution, it's more like trying to make you a cog in the machine or a bureaucrat where like, you know, in my own instance, I was a very restless kid and it was really hard to get me to focus. I was constantly tipping my chair And the teachers would go crazy. Same. They called me like the absent-minded professor because like I was never (laughs) listening to them. But then I would like sometimes have good answers. So it's it can be uh, it's a difficult line to to walk along where you want to give kids the tools and the education that they need. 
but you also don't want to squelch their creativity. Yeah. And the thing about the education system right now is, I, so there's this really popular TED talk. I think it's one of the most popular TED talks of all time by someone named Sir Ken Robinson. And it's just, do schools kill creativity? And he makes the point that schools are always based upon, do you do this right or not? Right. So you basically get penalized for making mistakes, whereas creativity is inherently full of mistakes. Yeah. And and it, when you are penalizing these kids for doing something that isn't exactly right, then they start to be afraid to express themselves how they want to express themselves. And yeah. over time, kills it all. Well, that's why so many kids, especially especially boys, they have to take Adderall and ADD medicine because it's unnat- it's, it goes against their nature to be sitting in this desk just taking in information, regurgitating out what they're expected to regurgitate and being quiet and obedient and never trying anything different, never coloring outside the lines. So it's, yeah, it's a big problem for everyone, but because of the nature of rambunctious boys in particular, I think it's especially hard on, hard on boys when they're trying to make their way and and learn. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there are some things that are going well, I think. So have you heard of Montessori schools? No, I haven't. So, so those are schools where the kids learn through play. Basically it's a self-directed system where there are teachers, there are kind of the basics, but the teachers give students projects to work on, but the student, well, okay, let me back up. The teachers don't actually give students projects. The students pick their own projects Hmm. and the teachers help them design the projects to maximize their learning. And the other cool thing about this is they don't get, they don't get squandered. They don't get grades and they end up being some of the most creative and well-rounded students. Like one of my, one of my good friends is a, he was a math tutor for several years for top students and he said the kids that come out of these Montessori schools are just on another level. Hmm. And, and a lot of people like to think that, Oh, if you don't give students the exact direction that they need to go, then they're not going to do anything. They're just going to be lazy and right. do nothing. Well, there's so much information out there that we should not be focused on giving information and it should be like the focus of schooling, I think should be more on how to make sense of information and discern what is true from what is untrue and what is important from what is unimportant. Because, yeah, of course you can go online and you can search amazing videos about how the polar ice caps are melting and about uh, the double slit experiment and all of these super (laughs) interesting scientific things that are very relevant for the future of technology and society and everything. Mm -hmm. But you can just as easily go and find cat videos or info wars, yep. crazy conspiracy <laughs> theories, or like there's, there's an endless supply of information. So I think the focus should be about how to make sense of that information and how to use the tools that are available to pursue whatever it is that you're passionate about in, in your life. Cause, cause that's one thing we talked about with the future of jobs, income and fulfillment is that in the far future, there's not going to be education for the purpose of finding a job like there is now. So right now, there's two purposes for education. The primary purpose is to help you get a job, basically. The secondary purpose is to help you navigate life and just live a happy, fulfilled life and basically find your path and become who you are. But that very much takes a back seat, it seems like, to just finding a job. So when we look towards yeah. the future, it's, it's going to have to give a greater weight to finding happiness and fulfillment and what you truly enjoy doing versus just finding a job. Yeah. And it seems like that is sort of happening in other countries. 
like I was looking at I was looking at the top schools in the world and let's see Finland was number 1 and they kind of have a similar setup as the what you were describing and I guess sort of the Montessori school too it's just kids can do what they want and there are, there are other countries like Germany that have tiered um school systems where the kids can go into trade school or go into art school very early on and they don't need to go through the rest of the crap that you have to go through in a general education system. So there's yeah. there are some good things happening worldwide. I think the US is just far behind. Right. Well, there are private schools that like you said the Montessori schools. I also know Elon Musk started his own school that mm. very, sounds very similar to Montessori where Basically, there are no grade levels. So if you're really good at math, you're going to be with the other kids that are really good at math, regardless of their age. Likewise, if you're really good at art or really good at putting words together, you'll be with those kids that are really good. And if you're falling behind, you'll be with the kids that are at those level. So there's there's no none of this like one size fits all approach. None of this mm -hmm. like either you get it or you or tough luck, which is basically the, the current system. And yeah. This is another, actually, Alan Watts has another take on this where he basically says that, you know, the whole system of school, it can be treated as a, the metaphor of a journey. Or oftentimes the predominant metaphor is that life is a journey or school is a journey. And so basically it's like, okay, you get to kindergarten and that's great because once you're done there, you get to first grade and then second grade and so on and so forth until you're done with grade school and then high school and then you go on to college and then it's like, okay, now I'll get to go to grad school and then you get a job selling insurance and then you're, <laughs> and then you're like, okay, got to make this quota. And then you wake up one day and you're 40 something years old and you realize that you now have whatever it was that you were trying to get the whole time, but you don't feel very different. And in fact, you feel like you have kind of been fooled the whole time because you thought life was a journey. You thought the point of life was to get to some destination. But life is not a journey. The universe is not aimed to go somewhere. I mean, from all we know, there's like a big bang and then a big retraction and it goes on ad infinitum. So yeah. the point of life is not a journey. Life is more of a dance. It's a musical composition. The point of life is to dance while the music is being played. So whether you're a little kid yeah. or, or a grown adult, no matter what it is, the point is to enjoy life and to be excellent in whatever it is that you do and to cut out all of the BS that you deem unimportant for, for you based on your own inclinations and what you find valuable. Yeah, I really like that lecture too. He's, dude, he's so good, but uh, he's so far ahead of his time too. Yeah. But anyways, so, let's, let's, I think we should put a couple stats to this just so that people understand how big of an issue this is in the U.S. So I don't know if you have some stats, but I, I have a couple. So okay. the U.S. current math ranking, at least this is from 2015, it's probably changed a little bit since then. But in math, we are number 518. <laughs> That's terrible. So we're behind Slovakia, Hungary, Lithuania in math. And okay, I'm sure there's there's great teachers and I mean, I'm not ripping on those countries, but given how enormous our GDP is compared to theirs and how much resources we have compared to them as the wealthiest country in the world, it is absurd that we have this um, that we have this low of a ranking that we're this far down the list. Yeah, it's it's terrible too because in the public education system, and this is probably true in most education systems, private school, college, whatever, but what happens is, especially in math, if you don't get one concept early on, like let's say you're learning your fractions or something pretty trivial, right, you know, when you're older, but not as trivial when you're learning it for the first time, but you still pass the class. Like, let's say it's only a small portion of the class at the time. You can still pass the class and move on to the next level. Hmm. But each level you move up, it assumes you know everything 
from all the previous levels. So when you're stuck on these early concepts, how are you going to succeed in math when you're being forced to go along with everybody else in the class, when you just needed yeah. a little bit of knowledge on a very specific topic and everything would click? Like right. I see people that, because I tutored calculus for a while, and I see people that know, they should know most of what's going on. Because calculus, the concepts behind calculus are relatively straightforward, but a lot of a lot of people get hung up on the algebra of calculus. Hmm. And it's it's just a self reinforcing system. Right. Well they I mean, one common metaphor is knowledge is a tree. And if you yeah. don't know the trunk of the tree, then how are you gonna make sense of the branches of the leaves? Yeah. So and that's, that's that's an issue. And and I think by going with the Montessori and Elon Musk approach where it's just based on where you're at, not how old you are or what your grade level is. That's just mm -hmm. such a better approach. Oh yeah, like I had a I had a friend in high school. He's one of he's still one of my best friends. He is a math genius, and he was actually able. Like we had probably a little bit better resources than most public schools. It was still a public school, but he was able to, after he uh, took his AP calculus class sophomore, junior year, he was able to take online Stanford math classes wow. in high school. But that's not available to most people. Right, and, I think, right. and I think the other thing is we, we, hold, we hold the people that are extremely far ahead back and we push the people that are more behind too fast. Right. It's just we're pushing everybody with their extreme diversity into this narrow line that they have to toe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like part of that problem is, like we said, the system of, of putting people where they belong as far as their skill set. I think another part of that is having enough data so that you can continue to optimize for each individual. So the current way that we collect data on students is at the end of the year, you get satisfactory, not satisfactory needs. Of, you know, it's like you get a basically a one word analysis. I mean, you know, private schools, charter schools, sometimes they do a better job of this, but by mm -hmm. and large, and they give it to you at the end of the year. It's too late at that point. Like you're going to go on summer vacation yeah. and next year you're just going to focus on next year. But if they treated it more like how the tech world treats their processes, where there's constant feedback you're seeing how, not only how each student is progressing in different areas, but you're also seeing how effective the teachers are at, at uh, you know, creating success for their students and how effective their teaching methods are. And then you optimize the system the next year. It's not rocket science. It's the same thing that we're doing in tech. You experiment, you analyze, and you optimize. But yeah. we're not doing that at all. We're basically saying, oh, well, you know, it didn't work for 40% of the kids. And then someone says, well, what are you going to do next year? And they say, well, we're going to do the same thing. <laughs> it's like, how can you expect different results if you never change the fundamental system and optimized it based on what you're learning? Yeah. I think now speaking of that is a good time to talk about the future. Like, what are the trends going forward? What do you see? Going yeah. On? Well, unfortunately, one of the big factors is the budget because mm -hmm. currently most people are in the public school system and they're beholden to budgets and state budgets. And people were, people thought, you know, like one possible future scenario is we make college free for everyone, just like Bernie wanted. We get someone <laughs> in the White House who is able to pass that through. But there's going to be a huge opposition to that. And there already is. People are saying, oh, well, how can we pay for all of that? Who's going to pay for it? Where's the money going to come from? But the reality is, if it's important enough, we pay for it. The U.S. GDP is $14.7 trillion. Okay? $716 billion of that is spent on defense. Quote-unquote defense. Yeah. $716 billion. To, to, make, to uh, put every kid through college 
it would only cost 75 billion. So that's a fraction of our military spending. And if you subtract that from the defense budget, we would still have by far the largest defense budget of any nation in mm-hmm. the world. So it, yeah, and the thing Yeah, go ahead. So the thing about that is we don't even need to put all of our kids through Harvard. We can just have their state school if you live in Illinois, you go to some sort of University of Illinois. I yeah. mean it's it's not like it's not like we're putting them through schools that have fifty, sixty thousand dollar a year tuition. Yeah, yeah. It's and the tax cuts alone that, that you know Trump passed through just recently, that's gonna cost two point three trillion dollars over the next ten years. Yeah. And, and there's there's not necessarily a bad thing with cutting taxes, but we don't have we're not cutting the government spending right We're increasing yeah government well spending. the deficit i mean yeah that's going to be a major issue for us coming of age and so it's like a double whammy it's like basically we're just putting off all of these ious that are going to have to be taken care of by future generations but then we're not willing to pay for their education so they can actually figure this out it's oh it's so gosh. rotten and just the whole system of government spending is so horribly corrupt that it's hard to see the light of day. But I'm hopeful that eventually the people will wake up. And I think one of the things that we have going for us is the inevitability of joblessness and automation, which is going to spark some serious change. So, I mean, we can talk about the scenarios, but that's a big factor in the scenarios that I have for worst case, best case, and most Mm -hmm. likely. Yeah, let's, let's start with those. Want to start with the worst case? Yeah. So the worst case scenario in my mind is that basically the status quo of what we're doing right now continues along the path that it's on, which to say that that's, I mean, you know, I guess it could be a little worse even than that, but, but, um, Basically, if we continue where the corrupt interests of government win out over the interests of the general population, that's a terrible situation. So if we don't... Because we learn exactly what they want us to learn. Yeah, and and it has this uh, negative feedback loop, right? So if we don't provide people with the education that they need, that creates more uneducated people. And guess what? Uneducated people are way easier to manipulate. And if you're able to manipulate people, then the handful of people at the top who are just looking out for their own self-interest, they're going to be able to exploit those people using all of the common ideological tactics that already are present, which is fear of foreigners, you know, religious fervor around a single, single like, mm-hmm. oh, my religion is the only right way to think about the world, um, oh, alternative yeah. facts, and just vilification <laughs> of opponents. Like when I see some of these, some of these ads for people, you know, running for government and they're just hit pieces on the opponent, I'm always thinking like, who is fooled by this? Because it's so blatantly just like, you don't have anything good to say about your plan. So you just diss the opponent. But a lot of people are, are fooled by that. And that percentage of people who are basically the, I don't want to say the, I mean, I don't want to, you know, basically sheep, you know, and that portion mm-hmm. of the population is going to increase. And we don't want to live in a world of sheep. It's because it's going to be really bad for the, the, the people who aren't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bad for everyone, really, except for the ones pulling the strings. Yeah, and I mean, just talking about ideologies, we don't even need corrupt government to to push these ideologies. If we have certain portions of certain regions of the U.S. that follow certain belief systems that can really poison thinking then that's an issue too like i have yeah. i have a friend who was brought up in an evangelical homeschooling group um he's since you know gone to Retention. college and seen the light um <laughs> but he was telling me about how in his science books there were so he he was learning biology but it was like bible biology so so the world very clearly is only two, 3,000 years old, whatever the claim is. 
And then, yeah. and then there are Bible verses. I've, I've, I've literally dug up bones that are older than that on an archaeological <laughs> excavation. So I can say I'm, for certain that... <laughs> I'm looking at a piece of 200 million year old petrified wood. Like, it's yeah. here with me. Yeah. It's just insane how some of this stuff can be taught legally. Right. And it is crazy that it's... And it's all under the guise of religious liberty, but it's just you can't give people false information when there's we know that not to be true and i feel yeah. like a, a big source of this problem is the narrow folk like the narrower the focus the bigger the problem the broader the focus the less of a problem so if you go to school and you're only taught the history of the u.s in history class and in theology class or science class you're only taught the history of Christianity, then you're going to come out of there and guess what? You're going to have very bad thoughts about people who are not Christians and who are not Americans. And there's going to continue to be this butting of heads internationally that will prevent global change that we need, like figuring out safe autonomous weapons, AI, climate change, all of these things. Whereas if instead in history class, you learn about the history of humanity all the way from the first organisms up through chimpanzees mm -hmm. and humans and how we've developed all all throughout up until now and likewise in science and religion class you talk teach about all religions from the early mesopotamia yeah. all the way through the greek and, and you, you tell them how christianity evolved out of judaism as did islam and yeah it, once you and see you can all, inform yeah. everybody about the the right information and and you also have to include in the curriculum that we're not even certain about a lot of about a lot of things. We can we can rule things out, but we can't say that this is the way things work for certain. Yeah. And but if you're learning about the Bible, which I think people should learn about religions because it's yeah. really a course on history. But I think if people realize that, for example, the Bible was written about six decades after Jesus's death. Think about, think about how that would actually work. And most of it was written more than 300 years after. That was just oh, the yeah. earliest that work was, that was. That was the start. And yeah. So that would be like somebody right now with only stories to tell, very little written communication, telling us a very detailed account of World War II. Yeah. How in the hell <laughs> would that would that work? Yeah. You well, know? I mean, we are going to do a future of religion episode at some point. Yeah. So we we should get much deeper into that when we have that episode. But I think what you're what you're touching on is is really important in that when we don't teach people the big picture and when we don't teach people the gaps that we still don't know then they have this mindset where they think like, oh, everything I'm being told is true. It's all been figured out. I pretty much just got to follow along and then I'll mm -hmm. know the whole picture. But I think, in, like, let's say your goal is to spark the interest in kids who should be scientists, who want to be scientists. It's in their nature to be a scientist. And you want to spark their interest as to how cool being a scientist could be and how this is a viable path. I think the best method would be to give them a, a big picture of everything and to show them all of these questions that are still unanswered and that they can be a part of, of finding out the truth that we still don't know. That's much more exciting than just teaching someone Newtonian physics and not even giving them a hint that there's something more like relativity. Yeah. Then they'll just be like, okay, this is just boring equations that have already been figured out. Why would I waste my time on this? Like if I were to, and I think we might have talked about this on our first episode, but I, I think if you tell people the story as the, in the way that humans have discovered it, like in science class, look, originally there was just the heaven and the earth. People didn't really think too much about it. Then people realized, hey, there's stars. What's going on up there? Oh, okay. There must be stars and heaven above and hell below. And then they realize, oh, wait, there's actually a sun that's moving okay, so it must be that the sun is moving around the earth. And, uh, you know, so there must be stars in like this other space area. 
And then you realize, oh, no, wait, actually, Earth is moving around the sun. And then it from there, it becomes way more interesting. You're like, oh, my God, not only are there multiple galaxies and solar systems, there might be multiple universes and there might be multiple dimensions that we can't experience. And string yeah. theory is the furthest uh, evolution of our current thought of, on science. And that poses yeah. that there are 11 dimensions and we can only experience three of them. Like yeah, how kind of time if if you include time as the fourth dimension. I think there's like some weird details there. Yeah. But yeah. But that's the point is that it hasn't really been hammered out. So if we get kids who naturally have all of this creativity and curiosity and instead of just like basically like like squeezing their brain into a cube and saying, okay, like, do you get Newtonian physics? Okay, now if you are still interested, you can go on to the X and who would be. But if instead yeah. you spark the the curiosity and just give them the tools that we currently have, but show them that there's so much more out there, that's how we're yeah. going to make major breakthroughs. Yeah, and that kind of touches on my best case scenario too, because there are a lot of really cool advancements coming. Let's just talk about VR for a second. Education in VR. And one of the issues with what you were talking about, getting kids excited about physics, it's kind of hard to experience these really abstract concepts in a concrete way. And it's so it's harder for students to really care about it. Like, why does this matter? Why does quantum mechanics matter to me but if we had some sort of vr world or vr education system where you could go in and actually take a journey through the cosmos yeah and see it firsthand what's going on you could even go to the atomic level or subatomic level and experience these really weird things that are going on yeah, or in history class, you can transport yourself. I mean, you can already do this today. You can transport yourself to the Parthenon in Athens yeah. and see the history that you're being taught and really feel like you understand it. And I, I could imagine in the future, we have whole simulations of the cons and you're out there yeah. and it feels like you're really riding around with Genghis Khan and, you know, you suddenly you get it and you know you can do that with any yeah. number of situations whether it's historical scientific social studies political whatever it is yeah and the cool thing that you could do as well is you could experience the the different accounts of history for example because there are so many different accounts of how history happened you could go through and actually see okay, this is how one person, this is how one textbook describes it. Now, what does the textbook of China describe it as? Or what does yeah. the textbook of Germany describe this as? And you can actually start to realize that just because you're told something doesn't mean it's true. You can actually, mm. you can actually broaden your horizons and realize that people think differently and people have different accounts and different experiences and I just think that would be an overall good thing for people to know. Yeah. And as we think about the best case, I think it, it's key to have all of the, the knowledge and, and understanding that, that we've been discussing. But it's also key to have the real person to person interactions, because that's one thing that you can't digitize. I mean, you can, but it's not going to be as good as the real thing, at least not yet. I right. mean, not you yet. could make the <laughs> argument that we are already in a simulation and that we can make something just as real as this, which I mm -hmm. think is pretty much inevitable. But let's say for the next like 50 years, probably not going to happen at that level. Because I think as you learn, even in grade school, but especially in college, a lot of your learning happens not from your classes or your professors. It happens from your interactions with peers and understanding social situations and learning from the people who are at the exact same stage in life as you are. So I think we're going to need to continue to have real life, some sort of real life college experience mm -hmm. that can be um, supplanted by, uh, by these VR experiences and other forms of technology. But we can't yeah. do without that either. Yeah, I mean, it would be really cool to have 
those things super intertwined. Like maybe you send kids off to a boarding school and hopefully this isn't, you know, just for the very wealthy, but you could send them off. But the purpose of that, maybe it's more of a camp, maybe not boarding school, but the purpose of it is to really learn these social interactions, like you were saying. And then you can also have these deep personal learning experiences because you aren't going to learn the same way as your best friend necessarily. Yeah. Personalized and, learning is huge. Going to be huge. Oh, yeah. Because imagine, imagine a system where you have this personal AI that is talking, or not talking, but it's designing your curriculum based on where you're, where you are in your learning. So if you're a super genius in math, but you aren't super strong at reading, then it can tailor your entire curriculum based on what you know. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's going to be huge. As far as my best case scenario, I think it's pretty much the same as, as what you had had said. I think fundamentally what it should accomplish is the ability for you to take on anything that life throws at you. So not just like, okay, your job, your, you know, your role in a current company, but any possible thing that, that life could throw at you because we're going to need to reinvent ourselves multiple times over, like even you and I, but to an even greater extent, our children and grandchildren yeah. are going to need to constantly reinvent as new technology progresses and all of that. And there's a really, uh, I thought insightful Zen story sort of about this where there's a Zen master sitting in his dojo and he's got, you know, he's drinking some sake with friends and the geisha girl is, is serving him and she's serving with such grace that he has an inkling that she might have some Zen training. So when she comes over, he says, excuse me, but I'd like to give you a gift. And she says, oh, I would be most honored to receive a gift from you. And so he takes out a hot coal with his chopsticks and he gives it to her. And so she has these long kimono sleeves. She whirls them up and she takes the hot coal and she goes to the back room. She puts the coal down and then she changes her kimono because the hot coal had burned all the way through. So then she comes back and she says, Zen master, I would like to give a gift for you, gift to you. And he says, oh, I would be most honored. And so she picks up a hot coal. And then he takes out a cigarette and says, oh, thank you. That's just what I needed <laughs> and, <laughs> and lights the cigarette. But like the, the purpose of that story, the reason why it's a good Zen story is because you should be able to fluidly respond to anything that life throws at you with grace and elegance and excellence and not having to like basically your whole intuitive system and your analytical system should be intertwined such that you live life as, as, a, as, a, as a ballerina does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with, with grace and, and responsiveness. And I think Just living in the moment, living in the moment. And it's, and that's all tied in with happiness too. You know, like, especially when people aren't going to have to work anymore, we should not be teaching them just about how to do a nine to five. We should be teaching them how to live a good life. And so I think in the past, like for instance, nowadays, it's not very common for someone to become a master carpenter and mm -hmm. just spend all their time creating beautiful wooden chairs. But I think in the future, we're gonna see a situation where whatever people enjoy the most, which tend to be things that we had done maybe thousands of years ago, just simply because of the caveman principle, people right. are gonna do those things. They're gonna be making music, they're gonna be creating a beautiful wooden desk from scratch. They're gonna be doing all of these, you know, writing poetry or or just, you know, learning everything there is to know about science and, and really philosophizing and looking at the moon and making love mm -hmm. to your lady friend and like <laughs> just truly enjoy or all man that, friend or man friend, all, <laughs> all that life has to offer. So that in my mind, that's the best case scenario, a situation that's oh, yeah. personalized and that's all based on being able to respond to anything that life throws at you with grace. And so you can be a happier, more fulfilled person as well. Yeah. And, and the foundation there is also learning how to learn. 
So being responsiveness means that you have to learn new things whenever some sort of new technology comes out. Like we're, yeah. let's say, let's say that quantum computing does become a feasible technology. The programming and the algorithms are completely different than they are now. So we're going to need a whole generation of computer programmers that need to reinvent themselves Yeah. to adjust to this new technology. Yeah, that's why I feel like comedians are some of the best prepared people. For, You're so though, good at improv. Because yeah, because they just it doesn't matter what what your what the conversation is about. They can make jokes and insightful. Like I think of Chris yeah. D'Elia or like Joey Diaz or some of these mm -hmm. or Joe Rogan. It doesn't matter what someone's talking about. They can just respond to anything. And if you think of someone who instead has just like if they're not prepared, they freeze up and they're like totally freaked out that is someone who has not learned to dance through life they're still trying to go through life as if it's a destination that needs to be reached and that they need to be prepared for only the most common situations that they might encounter yeah and i mean i didn't really talk about my worst case but i actually had something written that is the flip of that people being educated to be very rigid in their thinking and they can't they can't adjust to new technologies, which probably wouldn't be a huge issue in the super long term if they don't have to work. But if jobs are still a thing in the next twenty to thirty years, but they're taught to they're taught things that are relevant to ten years ago, because the current stuff that is being taught isn't even relevant to today. Yeah. Well, I, th I think that's that's you can see that clearly just through how people are guilty to not be working all the time. Like the American mentality is such that if you're not work, like even if you have enough money to not be working and to instead lay on the beach, read great novels, talk with friends, have dinner parties, all the things that you enjoy mm -hmm. most, then you still are going to feel this guilt about just like staying home. And that's that sort of like a almost like a protestant work ethic that's been so oh, yeah. drilled into us that we've forgotten how to enjoy our lives and yeah we might be fine in the long term because people aren't going to have to work anyways but if they're not able to be happy and fulfilled and they're just depressed and they just plug into their vr system in the same way that people come home from work and they just put on tv and they drink a beer and it's like they're not even experiencing society. They're just like watching a digital replication of society that they're not even like fully a part of. And that's mm -hmm. how they get their enjoyment. Like how backwards is that? Like if you talk to any person who's living in a, a very poor society, let's say in, in uh, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa or something, right. they, if they, could even imagine the amount of money that like the average American business person makes, they would imagine a life of luxury, not a life where you only have like two hours a day that are your own. And during that time, you're just glued to a television watching, you know, stupid reality TV or whatever. Like you would imagine a life that's full of adventure and passion and dancing and music. And yeah, I mean, think about right now too, with the, education system kids are stuck in a school for eight hours a day and it i mean that's the status quo you do have maybe two three hours to yourself maybe less because you have sports which may be fun to you if you're not being forced to do them but you also have homework yeah and then by the time you're done with everything but i also think it. that the the whole segmentation is not a good way to plan it out where it's like now we're doing science okay now we're doing art not, like it should yeah. be woven together. Like yeah. I think a, a better system would be, okay, we're learning all about a frog. So we learn the evolution of a frog and then we actually dissect a frog. And then afterwards you draw a picture of the frog from memory. And it's yeah. like you get the whole, like, you get it from all angles. And you, you write a paper about it. And then you yeah, write a like, paper about how a frog, a journey from a tadpole to a frog. And if you like poetry, you can write it as a poem. If you prefer prose, like. Yeah. Yeah, That's it's... awesome. I really like that idea. I've always kind of a 
thought of a similar approach like math and computer science i think they should be taught together yeah. like if you if you're learning how to do certain arithmetic you should be able to write a program that can just generalize the whole thing and you so if you're yeah. learning how to take fractions you can actually write a program that'll do fractions for you and you can learn fractions while you're learning to program and yeah. then I've also had a computer science course where we didn't this was my favorite one of my favorite classes ever. We didn't have any exams. We wrote papers on uh the stuff that we were reading about and we got to write it on any topic we want cuz we could go find whatever supporting literature we could find. Wow. It's it's actually I, I didn't expect yeah. it, but that kind of stuff is just awesome. That was, I mean, you wouldn't think of mixing English with computer science. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the current way that, that we have education is very didactic, meaning that you'll basically be like, okay, this is a wrench, and a wrench is used for this, this, and this. Okay, now memorize wrench. Okay, now match up wrench with what, this, <laughs> what it's used for. Whereas if instead you say, okay, here's an engine. We have to take apart this engine. Oh, how would we possibly take apart this bolt? We need a tool. Okay, which of these tools is the best tool? Okay, clearly the wrench. And then you actually take apart the engine and you yeah. in instantly know what a wrench is used for just in your deepest self because it's you've already done it. You've already used it for what it's intended for. So rather than having this approach where it's yeah. like, a teacher with a PowerPoint presentation telling you stuff and then you basically are just supposed to like recite it in your mind until you remember it. If you instead learn by doing, it's mm -hmm. much more effective. Like, you know, uh, my brother Ryan, he just went through a three month uh, graphic design intensive program in New York with this, this very cool school called Shillington. Started by this Australian guy who realized there weren't good enough designers in America. So he basically was like, okay, I'm gonna start my own school. But the way that they teach students is really interesting, because every single day, they give you a project brief. And you can choose from any number of possible ways to take on that project brief. And you go ahead and you do it and the teachers are there to help you. But you really are doing it. And by the end of the day, you turn it in, just like as if you were a consultant. So it's not like the General Assembly approach, which is like, basically, okay, here's all the PowerPoint information. It's all theory. Now you figure out how to actually do it after the fact, but we're not going to actually help you do the real stuff. Like, yeah. You'd take it. You take a multiple choice test. Yeah. on The stuff that you learned. So it's, that's why it's like, it's all in your head. It doesn't feel real. Like I remember even in business classes, you can't, you don't really get what business is all about until you're in it. No matter how mm -hmm. much theory they give you up front, it's really hard to understand what actually makes the world turn until you're part of that turning. Yeah. I have a issue with a lot of that, even in college. I mean, it's not specific to, through, uh, it's not specific to K through 12. Yeah. But even like you were saying in, in college and in business classes, they had that. Um, most of the business classes I took same thing. I mean, there were, there were a couple outliers where, it was a class that was in partnership with a local business or something. And then we got to actually, you know, work on some sort of project for them. But that's so rare. Yeah. My, my favorite business class was where we actually picked stocks and then we got to oh, cool. see how our portfolio evolved over time. And there was, I mean, there are very cool simulations that you can do. And that's the other exciting thing about tech is that, we're going to be able to have some very serious uh, simulations that simulate the real world in a much better way than current technology. But mm -hmm. unless we have the intention to implement that and move away from this didactic person in front of a PowerPoint, just telling you stuff, then we're not going to see the, we're not going to see our rankings go up. That's for sure. Yeah. And if we really do need lectures, I think the lectures should be more in the form of, a movie like you, you were saying go learn history by watching like being in the world of the cons yeah or or you know take the best lectures of all of the best professors 
and make them available to everyone. So it's not mm -hmm. like you'll have some people who have a subpar lecturer and some people who have an amazing lecture. Everyone has access to the creme de la creme of professors because yeah. you might as well just record it and share it if the goal is to teach and to learn. Yeah, so that's actually happening. So if you've ever heard of Coursera or edX, Coursera is oh. kind of a, a general app where you have colleges from all over the world. They'll put on, let's say, a teacher is teaching quantum information theory or something super niche. Or, I mean, it's they also have the, the basic classes too. But there's an entire lecture series in quantum information theory on Peter Shore, who's like one of the founders of... Well, he created something called Shor's algorithm, which is like why everyone is so impressed. It was like the first real world application of quantum computers. And there he is at MIT <clears throat> giving his lectures on quantum information. Wow. Is it free or? Uh, yeah, it's free. Wow. Yeah. And Cause that um, sounds kind of like masterclass, but masterclass you have to pay. I mean, it's still very affordable. Yeah. So you can you can do something where you do it for free where it's just like YouTube, you go and watch yeah. the lectures, but there's also something where you do everything. You take the exams, you, you basically take the class remote and you yeah. can get this, this certification that you completed it and I don't know, put it on your resume. I don't know how much weight they carry, which is the biggest issue because right. I would imagine it's really easy to cheat on something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, that's definitely a thing right now. And you also have mm. stuff like Khan Academy, which covers yeah. like math and science. I think those are the main topics. And then some test prep. Yeah, um, they do a great job. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about the most likely scenario because we haven't touched on that. So do you okay. want to do you want to start with your scenario or do you want me? To yeah, start with so mine? so I think the government will almost 100%, okay, I don't want to assign 100%, but a, a very probable chance that the government will completely fail at adjusting the education system. But the good news is I think private companies will do something about this because it's in the top companies' best interest to make sure that there are educated people out there. Mm-hmm. And what I think is probably going to happen is there's going to be some sort of online education curriculum, sort of like Khan Academy, but maybe a little more personalized. Like, let's say Google creates an AI education system where mm -hmm. it does track, maybe at first it's a little rudimentary, but it, it can track your own progress and you can get a world-class education wherever you are in the world. And yeah. that, that'll be kind of a, a worldwide thing. And I, so I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that I think overall things will end up in a pretty decent place. I think we'll go through some growing pains first. Like we're, I think we haven't hit rock bottom in the public education system for it to really be a catalyst for change. I mm -hmm. think the the point of no return is going to be the kids coming out of schools these days, like a vast majority of them are completely worthless to mm -hmm. um, to society. To modern businesses. And, yeah. yeah. And I think once that happens businesses will take the initiative like, okay, we need to do something about this and offer some sort of online education system or even some, it would be nice if they had brick and mortar places. Yeah. For, for the actual for person to, to, to person learning. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right about the private enterprises being the ones who pick up most of the slack, at least in the short to medium term. Mm -hmm. I do think eventually the government will figure it out and, actually implement the right practices. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen in the near term. I think that's going to be something that's only going to happen after the AI super intelligence revolution, <laughs> when yeah. it's more just about like, 
okay, we've created all the wealth that we pretty much ever need to. Now we might as well like give people the tools that are relevant because obviously there's no jobs that are very few jobs that any human would even be valuable, uh, you know, valuable at performing versus a machine. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that I do think that in the near term, there are going to be the right kind of schools for wealthy people. So it's unfortunate yeah. that I don't think this is going to spread to public schools in the near term. But I do think that with some of these schools that we've been talking about, Elon Musk school, the Montessori schools, I think that we're going to see a big uh, growth in that area where these mm -hmm. new schools are going to be popping up. And if you have the money, you'll be able to send your kids there and they will be much more prepared for the future. Right. But, you know, it's, it's certainly going to lag behind within the public sector, especially with all the deficits and everything. And, yeah. and uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of damage done before we figure it out. Yeah, and I'm really hoping that when the private sector takes over, they can offer these, these courses or this curriculum for either very, very cheap, like affordable to people in third world countries. Let's say it's $10 a year or mm -hmm. $100 a year to be more realistic, which, okay, in sub-Saharan Africa, $100 a year is still a steep price. But for most people in the developing and developed world, the hundred dollars a year isn't that bad you know and i'm just putting an arbitrary price on it but they don't they wouldn't need to pay for kids to go to some brick and mortar location which has some downsides in and of itself but they can still be educated and interact online with people mm -hmm. and i'm hoping that that can be a solution in the near term even if it's just online for now people can still learn what they need to learn yeah for the most part minus the the whole social skills thing which might be which might be viable you know talking to people over video chat it's it might be a, it's not going to be perfect but it'll be something mm -hmm. yeah so maybe do we should we uh, give some advice to people about opportunities and how they can better position themselves given the future scenarios that we've laid out yeah, yeah. So I think good. the, I mean, I think already the Khan Academy, Coursera, Masterclass, those are good places to start as far as virtual learning. I think also a lot of it's just about reading books and following your own curiosity. Like, I mean, at least with, with how I navigate my life, especially my academic life, I'm always just figuring out where my gaps are. So I, I have, I was blessed by my parents and and by society that I grew up in that I have a strong trunk of the tree, which a lot mm -hmm. of people don't have. But if you have that strong trunk of the tree, you just need to follow your own inclinations as far as what are you interested about? And it takes a while to figure that out, but you got to start somewhere. So you got to start exploring certain areas. And once you find out what you're interested in, you sort of move along that path and read all of the great authors you know, first, and then go into more niche and then go into more recent and up to date. And but if you mm -hmm. follow your own passions and really ask yourself, what is it that you find interesting about life? And what do you really love to think about? Then that's, that's a good place to start. Yeah. And, and you don't need to not everybody even learns through reading. So don't feel like you have yeah, to so if you audio or video, yeah, exactly. And so there are audiobooks. You can get the exact same information. And there are also podcasts, yeah. which um, there are probably podcasts on any subject you can possibly think about. Like I, I have, I listened to a couple that are specifically about data science related things. So what are the newest advancements on machine learning and artificial intelligence? Yeah. And, and you can find whatever your niche is. You can you can find podcasts that are specifically about advertising or specifically about history. Yeah. I would also just speaking of history, I would recommend hardcore history to Love everybody hardcore listening. history. So good. so good. Especially their World War 1 episode. That's my favorite. Dan Carlin's. It's, 
And the thing about that is you get them for free if you listen to them relatively recently after they come out. Because with this World War One, I, I think it's a six-part series yeah. with an average of four hours per episode. Like that's oh, yeah. more information than a couple audiobooks. Yeah. I I can't recommend Hardcore History enough. Yeah. The other piece of advice I would give is one thing Scott Adams talks about is your talent stack. So I feel like a lot of people, they just want to be really good at one thing. They think like, okay, I just want to be a master at real estate. And right. it's hard to be a master at real estate because there are a lot of good realtors out there, a lot of people that are a lot farther along than you are. But if you combine that with something else like real estate plus computer science, or yeah. real estate plus design or whatever it is. If or you can, marketing or, or marketing, yeah. Or. If you combine any two areas, almost like the better, the farther apart they are, the better, then you have a very unique talent stack. And maybe you're not the best realtor, but you might be the best realtor slash computer scientist slash designer that's yeah. out there. So, or maybe you learn like hypnosis and then you also learn um, you know, painting, abstract concept art, <laughs> and then you're like yeah. creating these mesmerizing works of art that if you had never oh, learned hypnosis, cool. you wouldn't have, you know, even created something close to that. Yeah, I really like that idea. Yeah. Cool. Well, this we has been the future of education. And things. thank you all for listening. Hope to see you next We're gonna time. We're going to talk about what has happened, what is currently happening and what will inevitably happen. The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future, baby. What's the world coming to? The past, the present, and the future.